one second. Okay, welcome to Media Growth Webinar. We're talking about supporting your most valuable resource, which is your employees. It's really important that you be able to, uh, you know, support your employees in these incredibly difficult times. So we're grateful to Jeff Litback, who's the CEO of Adweek, who's gonna be talking to us today. So this is gonna be a very informal session. We encourage you to put your questions in the chat box and we will take your questions first. We have a series of questions we're gonna ask Jeff. Um, but your questions are the most important, so please put them in the chat box. Okay, the COVID-19 new normal is beginning to take shape for B2B media companies. Teams are working on new strategies to compensate for the losses in revenue from canceled or postponed event, and of course, to reduce the stress that many employees are feeling, which is uh, one of the areas we're gonna cover today. So what are B2B media leaders doing to reskill and support their teams during this time? And that's one of the things we're gonna address. We're, of course, grateful to Jeff Litvak, CEO of Adweek, for a question and answer session to get his perspective on how to respond and how his response from Adweek is affecting the B2B media teams and what best practices have been used to implement to support the industry's most valuable resource, which is, of course, the employees. So, like everyone else, we have moved the dates for Media Girl Summit. They are October 12 to 14. Now, we are very grateful to our speakers who have all agreed to speak for us in uh, October. And of course, uh, their presentation will change to update with the, you know, the challenging times that we're all facing. So we're grateful to Fry Communications and MagHub for sponsoring this. Uh, MagHub is a cloud-based smart CRM publishing workflow system with an intuitive interface that's easy to deploy, use, and manage. Minimize cost and increase efficiency with all the tools necessary to run your business in one solution, including an ad sales CRM, issue layout and production, reporting, project management, customer portals, and more. Fry Communications is an award leading leader in the print and distribution and direct mail and information distribution. Fry, Fry provides comprehensive, scalable resources to manage products with state of the art energy and a commitment to excellence, and offers integrated solutions for sales production management, contact delivery strategies, circulation and audience development, as well as customer acquisition. So thanks again for our sponsors, MagHub and Fry. Now I wanna introduce Jeff Litvak. He is Chief Executive Officer and a member of the board at Adweek. He has a digital media native who leverages his 25 years of operational strategic and financial expertise to help media companies and private equity firms in sourcing, evaluating and transforming acquisitions. To Adweek, he was COO at Rob Report and Managing Director at Excel Advisors. Before joining Rob Report, he was Group President and Chief Digital Officer at ALM. Mr. Ledbeck holds a JD from Harvard Law and a BS in Economic from the Wharton School of Business. So now we're going to begin to ask uh, Jeff some questions. And um, like I said, feel free to also post your questions in the chat. So, Jeff, tell us a little bit about Adweek and business community it serves. Sure. Um, first, Kathy, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, so Adweek is a 40-year-old brand. We reach about 6 million uh, readers every month. Um, we reach brands, agencies, and publishing executives. My assumption is that uh, hopefully everyone on this call actually reads Adweek on a regular basis, because uh, if you're in the B2B media industry or if you're in the B2C industry, you generally rely upon advertising. Um, and if you rely upon advertising, our job is to help you do your jobs better. We support basically all the businesses and we provide all the coverage on what's happening in the ad marketing industry. Great. Well, thank you. It sounds like Adweek is really doing a good job. So which of your products and services has been hardest hit by COVID-19 restrictions and which has been impacted the least? And are any of your products selling better in this environment? Great question. So. You know, I think you have to break this down into kind of the components of what our business looks like. And let me a little bit describe our kind of kind of four, five kind of key business lines that I like to talk about. The first is that we have the ad supported media part of our business. The second is that we have our subscription and uh, subscription business. The third is our event business. The fourth is our licensing. And then we have kind of our education business as our fifth line of, of business. 
And when you look across those kind of five lines, each today in the COVID and the COVID environment, some are doing better than others. Uh, let's start with the ad supported part of our business, because I think that's the part that has, has struggled the most. Um, and it struggled because, as everyone knows, advertising, basically, as we got into March, uh, we began to see a big slowdown in ad spending, whether that was in the B2C space or in the B2B space, as we covered all this. Um, what we've actually seen has been really uh, interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, March was still a very, very solid month for us. Um, the first quarter was an incredible quarter for us. Um, what we saw beginning in April, um, which was a solid, which still a solid month, we saw a switchover from advertisers, basically everyone being open to buying, to basically people being more binary. What I mean by binary is either people were buying or they weren't buying. It wasn't a question of whether or not I could convince someone to buy at this point in time. It was a question of, no, we're not spending money. We've actually, in April, we've stopped spending. Um, everything's on hold and freeze, and we're not going to move ahead. It's probably one of the toughest things for a salesperson to hear and on a certain level, which is, it's just not going to happen. Um, and so when we looked around, what we saw is, from an advertising perspective, we saw it began to see a real slowdown in media support to the business. In particular, what I mean by that is actually the print part of our business and then on the digital side of our business. Okay, great. Thank if you. Were spending, Thank you well, I was going to say, if they were spending, what were they spending on? So what you're not going to see is you're not going to see the spending on the branding, right? People stopped spending on branding, but they were still spending on advertising to support basically lead gen. And what we saw is everyone became a performance marketer beginning in April. And what that meant was the products that basically could deliver the audiences and the data and information they could have to help build out their CRM systems are the ones that are really selling and selling, frankly, like hotcakes. So we saw a huge increase basically in a number of different areas. First, we saw it in webinars. We have uh, one of the best webinar businesses uh, in the, the media advertising space. A typical webinar will deliver somewhere between, we promise 800, but typically delivers on average 1,200 um, audience members for any given webinar we hold. Uh, in fact, today, what we actually were seeing in April and May is we started hitting new records. We started hitting new records in terms of both the number of attendees, uh, excuse me, number of registrants and the number of attendees, live attendees. Uh, we were seeing, on average, around more like 2,000 registrants, and we are seeing attendees hit more like 60% rather than our typical 30 to 40% of people being live at a given event. So the numbers have been fantastic. We actually moved from doing three webinars a week to now we're actually up to doing five webinars a week and still delivering the same type of numbers. So that's a simple example of what, what is working, Kathy. Um, mm -hmm. What else isn't working or what is working, what's not working is webinars are a form of events. But what's not working, obviously, is the flip side of events, which is on the, the event side of our business as far as live physical events. No, th those have stopped. Everyone's stopped, right? Mm -hmm. But what we had to do is figure out how we reinvent ourselves. Um, and we started to look at virtual events, what was happening in the marketplace, and looking at what we're doing for webinars. How do you differentiate between a webinar and a virtual event? That was one of the questions. Uh, and basically, what we've really delivered in terms of our promise, and our virtual events are, are also doing very well, is the idea that our webinar is still very thought leadership from a partner, but our virtual events are editorial led the same way our physical events are being editorially led with sponsors around them and supported by the sponsors uh, and what we're seeing is that we just uh, put together an incredible one we did one for ai and we have one coming up next week uh for commerce uh that has uh you know we don't we're not even doing a lot of promotion for these now where we're just basically maxing out on our total number of uh, possible attendees we're doing one on dni that will have over three thousand folks we've actually just closed the list um, because we're, we're hitting our maximum number with the vendor that we can work with. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. There's a lot of audience out there and audiences that are looking for education. They're looking mm -hmm. for value. The sponsors are looking for audiences and lead gen. And if you can deliver great thought leadership, you can deliver then great lead gen across the board. So those are a couple areas. I'm happy to go into the other ones if you want to hear a little about what happens in subscriptions uh, and some of the communicate uh, some of the stuff we're doing around communities. Right, right. So it sounds like you've retained your sponsors in your webinars. We have absolutely retained our sponsors in all of our webinars. Correct. Yes. Uh, right. You know, again, we're seeing more demand now than ever. Right, right. So um, your sponsors are getting leads from the webinar. So the sponsor of the webinar gets all the leads of everyone who signs up, right? So that's there. Correct. 
Right, help them. Okay, okay, great, great. Sounds like you're really adapting well. It's a straightforward it. equation. The key there is that, you know, when we look back, I just looked over the last three years compared to some of our competitors like AdAge and others. At one point in time, we were more or less on par with the number of webinars we're doing. We now do uh, nearly, I think it's like 10x what they'll, they'll do in a given year. Um, as we, especially now, this year will be even higher because we're almost doing one a day, as I mentioned. You know, what the differential is, think about if you're if you're out there and you're saying, I want to do webinars because they work and you want to do something like this, think about why you're doing the webinar and what the value proposition is to your audience. You've got to deliver real value to the audience. And that's really the secret sauce, which is to, not to do what the sponsor basically wants to do, which is necessarily sell, but rather think about it more in terms of thought leadership and giving the sponsor opportunities to participate in something that has tremendous value for the audience and therefore tremendous value for them. Right, right. Good, good. So it sounds like you're having great success with webinars. So that's that's really good. So why don't we talk about how are your customers' needs, demands, and our behaviors changing during this period of uncertainty? How sure. sales people's routines and responsibilities been affected by those changes? Is well, let me start with uh, when you say customers, customers is, is an interesting word, right? Who are your customers as, as a media company? You have many customers. You've got your audiences. You've got, so you've got your readers, you've got your subscribers, you've got your sponsors. There are a variety of people. Let me hit on some of the other areas, which you, let's talk first about kind of our, um, our community is a word I use. From the time that I got at Ad Week, I kind of, I believe that a media company shouldn't just be about the ink that's, or the words that are on the page or on the digital page, right? A media company needs to be much more focused around the community it's trying to serve. It shouldn't be looking at the community from the outside in, but rather from the inside out. So we need to be a part of that community. And if you do so, you can really add real value. And Kathy, you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. In a time of such turbulent change, it's such turbulent shifting that's happening. Mm -hmm. What our audiences and our communities are looking for is more intelligence and better intelligence. The best intelligence can come from basically peer-to-peer -peer intelligence and connecting people. So by way of example, what we have hugely succeeded at is with CMOs in particular, and a critical audience to us, a critical audience to everyone who's on this phone call, is connecting these CMOs. All of a sudden, beginning in you know mid-March, these CMOs went from having these you know elaborate plans of what they're going to do in 2020 to seeing themselves saying, "All this creative, all this amazing work they've done, got to get thrown out." They have to mm -hmm. talk to their customers differently. What should they be doing? How should they be thoughtful in their messaging? And yet they were each siloed in their own little island. So what we did is we brought them together and we started holding calls with CMOs. We have one going on in about an hour with 25 CMOs of the Fortune 100 companies who are going to be participating with the chairman of, of JetBlue. And they're going to be talking about things. So we had um, you know, the former CEO of PepsiCo come on and talk about how do you talk about messaging? What should each industry be doing? How if you're in the airline industry versus being in the hotel industry? Uh, versus being in the financial services. How do you think today about the messaging at that point in time? And that's really an awareness, basically a huge value that you provide. I'll be honest, we didn't make any money off of it. Didn't make any money off of it. But I'm more proud of that work than anything else we've done because what we did is we connected the community. And we actually went so far as just recently, uh, we worked with all the sports industry. So the sports industry all shut down. We brought all the CMOs from every major sports industry together to work on an initiative basically that was launched last week. Um, which is around basically the hero project, basically, which is the idea is that, you know, who's your hero as a sports leader? So we had the NFL, the NBA, the uh, MLS, the PGA, et cetera, all participate in this and work together. And Adweek was in the background coordinating all this and working with them to get these projects off the ground. Huge impact for us in terms of what we can do for society, but also a big impact for us on how we help our industry as a whole. So it's just one aspect, I think, of bringing people together and community and kind of solving that problem. The other side you talk about is, is kind of what are our customers thinking about, right? What are, you know, more so our more typical, you know, demanding customers uh, from, from the sponsors that we work with. And as I said before, they, they are all about one thing today, ROI. They've all become performance marketers overnight. And when you're talking to them, you need to think about performance. And to succeed at that, you need to know what you have and so the arsenals and tools in your own toolkit and products and solutions that you have that can really help them get there because some people are going to be able to do a webinar other people will be able to write a white paper and some might not be able to do either of those two things so how can you help them 
To do that, we launched a number of new opportunities, uh, including one around like micro learning, which was to help them basically with a five minute video uh, that we fully animate and we work with them through our content studio to create this basic five minute video that is a micro learning opportunity. And we launched this just in the last uh, month. Right, great, great. Well, I think, you know, what I'm hearing from all the B2B media executives at this, uh, you know, we want to serve the audiences that we have and, you know, making money is kind of, uh, you know, second at this point. So, you know, it sounds like you're saying you're doing, you're saying the same thing. So that's good. Um, so, you know, salespeople are working from home. Uh, you know, that's like you said, uh, you know, before we started that, uh, you know, it's challenge for people to work from home. They don't get the interaction, the social uh, interaction that they get at, um, at the office. So, how are you helping your salespeople uh, with their new routines and, and new responsibility from the changing world? Sure. Um, look, let's talk about morale first, right? Mm -hmm. um, sales teams all about wins. They 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 want to win, uh, and so there's no doubt that right now, getting a win is even that much harder than it ever has been. True. Sure. So morale can be a challenge. Um, and so you've got to be very much as a CEO or the, or, or the chief revenue officer or the head of sales, whatever your position is, you need to make sure that your team, to, for them to win, they have to have a good morale. If they're negative and they're not thinking that they can get it done, the results are going to be self-fulfilling. So what we tried to do with the sales team in particular, and I'll talk about the company as a whole next, but with the sales team in particular, we really have taken our time to really understand like how they're doing and make sure that they know that we have their back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Across the board, it began, you know, with just, I think across the board, people need to understand like regardless of what position you're in, you know, the first fear that they have is for the jobs. Ad week, at ad week so far, we've not had to lay anyone off, nor have we had a furlough, we haven't furloughed anyone, nor have we done any reduction. It's not wow. easy every day, every day is, is a fight, and there's a mm -hmm. lot of uncertainties and the support from, you know, the government and otherwise things, the programs that they have are all very helpful so that I can make the right decisions and not have to make a short term decision and have a long term effect. Um, so we've taken advantage of all the programs that are out there. But the key to the sales team is focusing on them and making sure they understand that you've got them and you've got their back. How do you have their back? Well, as a CEO, one of the things that I've done is, you know, um, I joined their you know, weekly sales meeting. I used to do this when I first got here, but as the team grew and as they got, you know, were succeeding tremendously, I stepped back. I let my sales leaders take the lead, but I came back into the focus and spent more time in promising them and answering their questions and having a one-to-one -one conversation with them. Second, I joined their actual individual calls that they've had, not to pester them, not to be negative, but I want to listen to them. I want to understand where their challenges are and I want to reassure them that we're here to support. And then third, which is most important, is give them the toolkit that they need. Help them with more products, more solutions. You need to be more innovative today than you ever have been. We are a constantly evolving business. In the last three years, we've grown um, at over 40% per annum. Wow. Okay. So we've done great. And we're a company that grew through a lot of innovation. But we it right now requires even more. So the entire team basically works on behalf of the sales team. We work for the sales team, my executive team. We meet basically every, originally we were meeting every day. Now we meet every Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. And our conversations aren't about the problems. Our conversations are about results. Mm -hmm. We call it a results meeting. And our conversations about how do we help the sales leads? How do we make sure they have the solutions they want? How do we execute faster? So from a strategy to execution, a time frame has collapsed. So when we come up with the ideas around micro learning, getting those out quickly. When we went from three dates to five dates, how are we going to do that? How can we be successful and show the audiences to make sure we weren't um, creating a whole host of other problems for our current buyers? Even the editorial team has been incredibly innovative. They've launched a ton of new products from uh, DNI Podcast to Ad Week Together, which is a daily show. It's going to move to to weekly. Um, to the way forward, which is bringing together top CEOs in the industry to talk about how they're working together. And we're doing all this in the background to create a more powerful product and solution for our entire team. On the virtual event space, where we just launched last week, um, we're gonna have a summer series, which is gonna consist of, I think in the order of magnitude of around 10 plus virtual events we'll be doing 
between now and the end of July. And those are all new events. Those are things that weren't planned before. And what we're trying to do is really focus our sales team to deliver results. And as we think about the sales team, it's not just a product in general, it's the product that's right for that market. In other words, we serve a lot of markets. So by way of example, with the virtual events, we have one on email marketing for those technology companies that are focused on email marketers, right? Which are hugely successful. The commerce, I gave you that example. Commerce industry is doing really well. Look around and see which industries are, counter, are, are being counter um, uh, cyclical that are actually succeeding right now. Those are places where sponsors have dollars and they're looking to tell their stories and give your sales team the tools and the programs that are gonna help them tell the stories. That's what we've been doing at a high level. Um, would you like me to talk a little bit about, about what we're doing from a company level? Because it's a little bit different. Right, right. No, that would be great. I mean, it's it sounds like you're you're doing extremely well, uh, and that's uh, that's encouraging. So many. Yeah, well, uh, well is a relative yeah. term today, right? Well, well, three <laughs> months ago is different than well today. Um, right, right. <laughs> and I'm happy with the results. I couldn't be prouder of the team. It's not me. It's the team effort, right? It's everything that the team is doing around and how we've come together. I think what it began though with I think one of the things that we did early on was to make sure we took stress out of the equation. The mm -hmm. most important question we had going into um, COVID, right, back in early March, was as companies started to lay people off, they started to furlough and the like, was am I losing my job? That is completely counterproductive. Mm -hmm. If people are spending the day worried about whether or not they're gonna have a job, they are not gonna be doing the jobs very, very well. So the first thing that I did was call together a town hall and I was as transparent as I could be with everyone. Transparency, I think, is the key regardless of good times or bad times. Right. Employees appreciate that and they're going to work on your behalf. I was clear with everybody there. Our job, and I've been clear with it, our job right now has got to be focused on one thing and one thing only, revenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, we're all, if we're all rowing in the same direction and we're all focused on revenue, and that doesn't matter, and I was clear with the team, that's not the salesperson's job. That's the circulation manager's job. That's the editorial director's job. That's the journalist's job. Every single person in the company has got to be concerned about revenue because if we produce revenue, we protect the jobs. And we, if we pr produce revenue, we protect our futures. And so we really did that smartly. And I think we had a great conversation to kind of ease some concerns about how we were going to do it and making sure they understood the transparency of where we were and what we need to do. Second, I actually called from home, I called every single one of my employees on their on their cell phone and spoke to them to see how they were doing. Mm, that's to check great. in. After a couple of weeks of basically being isolated and apart, I just wanted to know if they were okay. Mm -hmm. Third, yeah, that's important. Yeah, it's it's a simple thing. It took time and it took time out of my schedule, right? But but I I learned a lot in that process. And I got to really listen to them and understand how they were doing, what I could do to help them make better. If they were having problems with their computers, uh, with their home internet, whatever it was, it's like, okay, well, let me help you solve that. Let's not make these things get in your way. Sure. Third was just making myself available. So I have an open door policy at, at, at Adweek. At all times, anyone can come in and people do regularly. How do you have an open door policy in a virtual world? Well, it's Slack, effectively. <laughs> So I traditionally mm -hmm. haven't been on Slack. It's not that I don't know how to use Slack. I've used Slack at other companies, um, set it up at other companies, uh, but just because of my, my my open door policy and how busy I was, I didn't want another virtual, another digital channel. You know, I was like, get me through email if you really need to reach me that way. But being at home now, I need a, a more direct way. So I set up my own CEO Slack channel where people can write me on a private basis or on a public basis to give me ideas. Um, and basically that, that's worked well again, so the, the employees felt comfortable now reaching out and the open door now I've extended it out a little bit further. Uh, and then finally, I think the, the most important program we've launched recently in the last uh, two, uh, two and a half, three weeks now is a wellness programs. So if you're a CEO, if you're part of a company, it's stressful being at home all times, right? As I mentioned before, either you've got the roommate playing the drums, you got the kids running in and out. Um, and yet, you know, how do you manage this level of stress? You know. Mm -hmm. um, how can we help our employees? And I realized I'm not an expert in stress. Um, and so we brought in actually an outside company called the Health Enhancement Company. Uh, and they've been great partners with us now. Um, they started with basically surveying all of our employees and how could we help them? What can we do? And we came back with kind of five components around ergonomics, mental fitness, 
functional movement, functional nutrition, and, and posture, things that people basically were concerned about as a whole. And then we broke that down into some um, online virtual programs that we're doing and some emails. So now what we do is every Tuesday, we have a Mindful Tuesday newsletter that kind of gives you tips on how to take a breath, how to be thoughtful, how to de-stress, and how to take time out. And that can be as simple as saying, you know what, for an hour a day, you need to not be on Slack. You know, mm -hmm. block the time for yourself to say you're not going to do anything on Slack or otherwise. And unless it's an emergency, you have the time for yourself. And I've said to the employees, you need to be empowered to do that. I empower everyone, even though we need to work together, everyone needs to find the time off, right? Uh, it can mm -hmm. be something as simple as, you know, when you when you walk in the morning, put on one set of clothes at seven o'clock, when you're done with your day now, change your clothes. That could be helpful. Mm -hmm. We also basically put in place a number of programs like Tai Chi and, yo and Yoga Tation, which is a movement, kind of yoga plus movement. Um, and we're doing these programs once a week, um, where actually twice a week with our employees. Uh, and what's interesting is the people joining the most are actually our sales team. Um, they're joining these, these programs the most because I think they've got the most level of stress as a whole. And they're really finding these programs that, that you know, the, the health enhancement company is putting on for us in a virtual world. I wasn't sure if people would actually participate in Tai Chi or, or yoga, uh, but they're loving it and they're showing up and they're having a great time. And then finally, you know, I know a lot of companies are doing like happy, happy hours and things like that. Those are good and we, we do all that. Um, but we've also done things like um, a mental health day. So uh, this past Mother's Day, I gave not just the not just the mothers of the company, but everyone in the company. I said, go home early. We're going to close the office, close the office right at 1 p.m. All of us should go offline and just spend some time with your family. Or I said, I said to them, if you had enough time with your family, spend some time alone uh, and and find the time that you need for yourself. So that's kind of what we've been doing to help our employees from whether it's the sales team or overall employees, because the health of the employees is the health of the company, as you said. Right, right. No, that's good. It sounds like you're doing a lot of good things to support your employees, which is really important and also to support your 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 customers. And I just encourage, again, uh, the people who are attending to put uh, questions in chat and we're happy to answer your questions. So, you know, you already addressed this to some degree, uh, Jeff. Um, so with all the programs you're doing, it sounds like you're doing a lot of different things for wellness and to really help people, help your sales teams to be, um, to have good morale in these times with all the different uh, programs that you've implemented. So uh, with all of that said, um, if on a scale of one to 10, how would you say your sales team's morale is right now? Uh, scale one to 10, I would give it a six or a seven, somewhere in that order mm -hmm. of magnitude. You know, again, they're putting points on the board. What we're seeing today is more singles and doubles versus before we were doing triples and home runs. And that's mm -hmm. a change, it's a change in mentality, right? Um, so, you know, where I'm so proud of the sales team is the fact that, you know, I think most people probably, a lot of companies think are hunkering down, right? And going back to their main, the best customers and saying, how do I get you to spend more with me? We certainly want to do that. Um, but what we've seen is a lot of our biggest and best customers have put have 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 put breaks at big companies, and mm -hmm. you know from corporate basically have said nope, we're not spending right now. Put a hold on this. We want to be sensitive to the market and the very thoughtful companies. However, there's a whole set of SMEs that are out there, much wider breadth. So our average uh, salesperson has somewhere in the order of magnitude between 200 to 400 accounts that they're responsible for, and in any given week or any given month, they're probably reaching like 100 to 200 of those folks, right? During this time, what we've seen is our salespeople has gotten more aggressive about reaching out to more customers and new customers. In the last six weeks, and for the year as a whole, we've reached, I think it's somewhere in the order of magnitude, I'm gonna look that up real fast, 28, we sold 28 new accounts, 28 new accounts, accounting for 10% of our overall revenue for the uh, year to date. And so that's an incredible opportunity. And that's, those type of wins, I think are really gratifying for our team. And as I said before, we're trying to help them find new opportunities, but also they're out there basically really making them happen. So there's nothing better in a tough time like this to bring in new business. Um, and that new business is basically help to supplement them and keeping them, I think, you know, going stronger. Uh, but I, the hardest job in any company all the time is always sales. It's the toughest job. Right, right. And in these right, times, well it's, tough. it's that simple. So we, we you know, they're doing well, and I'm happy they're doing they're doing well. But anything I can do to help them do better, I'm here for them. 
Yeah, that's great. Well, 28 new accounts. I don't think there's too many B2B media companies that can say they've brought in 28 new accounts. So that's really good. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how uh, you brought in the 28 new, your sales team brought in the 28 new accounts? Because uh, that is pretty remarkable in, in this uh, difficult world. Sure. Um, you know, I, look, I don't think there's, I don't think it's per se a secret sauce, right? Part of it is uh, the sales team basically has got, you know, I'm very fortunate to have um, a great, uh, two great head of sales, um, one of whom basically oversees some of the operations and set up a, a great CRM system uh, and has set up a bunch of tools that allow our teams to be, be even stronger at lead gen. Uh, as a simple example, we follow and track all of our competitors in a wide breadth of competitor sets to really look at, you know, who's spending with them. And by doing that, we're able to then see every week which accounts are still spending. And we've been very focused on making sure that if someone's spending in the industry, um, in our industry, where we're the number one leader, we reach more people than anyone else, we can be more effective. We have not just our reach, but our effectiveness in terms of lead generation and not just number, but quality of leads. And this comes from our clients is better. We're making sure that we reach out to those people. So there's no kind of stone uh, you know, unturned uh, at the end of the day. And our team has done great with that. Just having the right tools has really, I think, helped them. Uh, and then secondly, in terms of tool set, it's a product. As I said before, we've thought about the industry from a counter cyclical perspective. What are the areas that are doing really well today and how deep are our relationships there? And do we have the right products for that group? Can we reach further into them by developing new products? And as I said, commerce is an example of that. We've always done retail for the last two years. We've been doing retail and we've been covering commerce. We've been building a strong audience there. Um, but we've not spent a lot of time going after the kind of sponsor dollars within that area. By building a program specific around commerce, guess what? We were able to create new revenue opportunities because we have the audience. We just had to focus on basically making sure there was a reason for the commerce person to be a part of our conversation. Right, yeah, Edwick has had a great reputation for many years, and of course that relationship with your, your audience is, uh, has done you well, even in these difficult times. Yeah. So let's, you've, you've mentioned this before, but let's go into more detail on how management is supporting the members of the sales team and their efforts during this stressful period. Sure, so, um, well, I think, you know, as I said, we, we've helped the sales team already. We, we touched on this already by, uh, you know, by be, being there and being supportive. It's not their job to bring in the revenue. It's every single employee's job to bring in the, the revenue. I think that's distinctive to, you know, Adweek. I don't think enough media companies, all the employees take that seriously enough, certainly not in good times. Everyone thinks it's the sales team's job. Uh, when I got to Adweek, I wrote two words on my, my whiteboard. Think revenue. And I continue to say the same words three and a half years later. In fact, I added to that two additional words, not just think revenue, I added do more. And the difference between think revenue and do more is don't just think about getting the revenue, do more on behalf of your clients. Make sure that revenue is sustainable. Make sure the client's gonna come back every year. And through that, if we're all thinking that way, we can be more powerful. Um, but at the end of the day, I'll also say that, you know, one of the areas, uh, Kathy, that, you know, it's one of your other questions kind of is, is, you know, how do we help them achieve their goals? Make sure you have the best product. So right now, a number of things are happening. Um, with events not happening today, our marketing team has theoretically less work to do. Theoretically is a key word, right? They're not out trying to drive audiences or sell tickets. What do you do with all that excess inventory? Where do you spend the time? We focus on marketing team to say, okay, let's actually focus on spending the same dollars, time, energy on sales marketing instead of on event marketing. And that's part of, I think, the wins that the sales team are, are receiving is that they're getting a lot of attention right now, not around trying to sell tickets to events, but we're spending a lot of time on making sure that all of our marketing materials are the best. So where we used to send something out once a, once every other week, we're now sending things out every week with updates to all of our customers on all the new products and solutions that are coming out. On a different side of the, of the house, the editorial side of the house, right now in these kind of changing times, how can you help the sales team do well is be the best. Be the best at what you do. And our core product is our editorial. And we've invested a lot in the last three plus years in editorial. But in these times, being even better and smarter is important. 
So we're actually spending time thinking about and working with our editorial team to be even more successful than we already have been with making sure we serve our market well. Our audiences are up and everyone's seeing that, right? The audience have more time, they're reading more, et cetera. What do we do with those audiences? How do we convert them better? If not just um, brand, it's also the buyers. So how do we make them become more part of our community and build deeper relationships with the potential sponsors? And that's been a lot of also where we're spending a lot of our time is not just thinking about it from the perspective of sales, but thinking about the entire product suite and set them a whole. Right, right. That's good. Yeah, you have to bring everybody together, both editorial and sales. You know, of course, content is still king. And if uh, you have good quality content, then obviously the, the customers want to uh, to advertise with you. So sure. that hasn't changed. Right, right. But I think we lose sight of it sometimes, especially I think we lose sight of content being king in the challenging times. Right. The first thing you want to do is cut the costs. A lot of people mm -hmm. want to cut costs. As I said, my whole thing is you can't cut your way to success. Right. You, you, you succeed by growing, by thinking revenue. And when you think revenue, you have to think about the product and you have to invest in the product. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean spending more dollars, but maybe it's more attention, more time being spent to make sure you're doing the right things with the people that you have. And you're really serving the right parts of the market and the ecosystem. You're building solutions. As I said, our editorial team has done a phenomenal job of launching three new products all in the last six weeks that are resonating with strong audiences and bringing in more people. And when I say more people, what does that mean? We actually are registering. We've, we've, we've gone from registering, you know, um, X thousands of people every week to now as much as 3X that number. So that means our databases are growing at an accelerated rates. The faster our database grow, the more successful we can be with each one of our products, especially lead gen solutions, because we can then target better and reach out to the right people. So there's a cyclical kind of cycle uh, part of the business that I think a lot of people don't always understand or don't spend enough time thinking about how one hand really feeds the other. Right, right. That's important. Yeah, it's it's a team effort in publishing editorial and sales. So good, good. good. That's a great input there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, creative strategies that your salespeople are implementing to achieve their goals. I mean, obviously, they have to be very creative in these challenging times to be able to uh, to achieve the success that they've had and to increase your revenue. Yeah, I think um, our sales team to succeed, again, it, there's not a secret source here. It, it's a mostly hard work. I got to be honest with you. It's mostly hard work um, and pulling in. I think one of the, the, the most, not, it's not really a creative strategy, it's just a strategy, is to pull on the executive team and, and folks who can help them with the sale. So right now I'm getting more requests from our sales team um, than I ever have for help and assistance with the calls that they are on to help them with the proposals, to help our, our you know, SVP of, uh, of a customer experience to jump on calls with them to talk with the client about how we can succeed and help them. We've seen them engage more our head of webinars and bring him into more conversations. So the, the traditional side of the house and that's not necessarily always involved with the sales call, is now being, is part of the sales call. It goes to what I said before, it's a culture of inclusive, inclusivity and that we're all in this together and we're all gonna support the sales team to succeed. They can set, they can tee up the opportunity. We can help them close the door because we've got much deeper product knowledge and much better understanding. And we're gonna be the folks who are gonna actually, they're gonna hand off to after they make the, the sale itself. So we bring the teams in even earlier right now. Right, 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 that's good. Yeah, that's important uh, to help them help the salespeople to implement um, their sales goals. And it sounds like they're still achieving their sales goals, which is great. So when you say that it's hard work, uh, what do you what do you see that your salespeople are doing to um, you know, you said that you they get, you know, some mental health days and, and you're trying to uh, help them with the uh, yoga and some of the new things to uh, adapt to the, the stress of the time. So you know, can you elaborate more on how, you know, the hard work just makes it happen? Sure. Well, you know, the hard work is one of the most important things. And again, good times or bad time, um, you need to be reaching out to customers uh, and you need to have a, a good solid pipeline. Uh, more important now than ever to get the frequency of calls up, frequency outreaches up. And that's, we've seen that, right? Our numbers are reflecting a huge increase by the sales team. They're putting in more time, more hours, and, and more energy into making sure that they're reaching more customers. 
and having more conversations. So there's just a lot of activity. It's a lot of just activity. And as I said before, it's singles and doubles rather than triples. Um, so the time before might have been spent on some big proposal. Now it's time spent with lots more customers who are going to contribute in smaller amounts. But those, as I said, the nickel and dimes add up at the end of the day. Um, and so what we're seeing is, you know, more twenty-five to you know thirty-five thousand uh, dollar sales rather than the hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollar sales that we might have seen before. Um, so you got to do more sales, more clients, more customers, more conversations. And that's really what's, what you're, we're seeing happening is, is they've got more opportunities to do this, um, but they've got to be on the phone more and they've got to be out reaching out with more folks and really understanding the needs of the customers and more customers. Right, right. Well, that's great. So let's talk a little bit about what you're hearing about how long the situation might last and how the health and safety concerns could impact B2B media products, processes, and, process, and uh, profits going forward. Everybody's uh, concerned about the future. Sure. Uh, look, I don't have a crystal ball any more than anyone else does, um, but I can give you some of my thoughts and how we're looking at the world. First off, for a lot of B2B media companies, uh, a large percentage of their revenue today is associated with uh, events and a big portion of their profits, mm -hmm. essentially a larger portion of their profits. So, uh, you know, for us, it's about 25% uh, of, our, of our business today is, is associated with a live in-person event. Um, and we need to figure this out because it's uncertain when we're going to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uncertain whether we can hold a 20,000 person event, like a huge trade show, to being able to hold a conference of a thousand people, to even being able to hold just a 25 to 50 person event. Mm -hmm. In my crystal ball right now, with the pace, we've been going at a much slower pace than I had expected for us to be back in our offices. You know, it's really a question mark of even in the third quarter, will we have an opportunity to really gather people in any mass, mass being above one person. I mean, in, in all honesty, I'm not even sure you could gather 10 people in a room right now. You know, and when that's gonna happen, and if you're not gonna be able to do that, because a lot of us have pushed back our live events into the second half of the year and into the, the, the third quarter, pushing mm -hmm. them into the fourth quarter, is that gonna make any difference? I think that's, that's gonna be the, the hard part for each of us. We need to figure out a strategy of what is gonna happen from a live events perspective in person. And if you're not gonna be gathering in person, what happens when we get back into the offices and you don't have in-person event, but you have virtual events? Will people attend? Will people still engage in that the same level of, that we're seeing today? Because the dynamics will change from being at home to having the camaraderie and the friendships and the busyness that happens in a typical office. So that's, that's the first and most important thing I think for all of us to be thinking about. I think most of us are. Second is mm -hmm. when are we going to be back in, right? How do we know? How how do we figure this out? You know, and you know, uh, New York City in particular. Let's be honest and frank about it, right? And realistic. Don't drink any Kool Aid, uh, and I don't, right? I'm trying to be as optimistic as I can be, but I'm realistic. From the beginning, I've said all along, I don't understand what we're doing because what I meant by that is, New York City is is how many millions of people live on the island that is a couple miles wide and a couple miles long. And how many more millions of people come in every single day? Six, seven, 12, I think it's 12 million in, in New York City as a whole, right? And coming from Long Island and Westchester and Jersey, we've not got another, you know, maybe double that in a very, very small square footage. It is a city that is going to be problematic for us to be able to be, to have the social distancing if that's what we're trying to achieve. I don't know how it comes back and when it comes back. So. I'm concerned about this, right? When do we bring our people back? How do we bring them back safely? It's clear to me today that it's going to be in a phased approach. And we've talked to our employees about this. But when that phase is going to happen, who's going to go first? You know, I could tell you that from my perspective, it's going to be people who want to go back. Because there is a large section and, 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 and a portion of our employees, and I'm sure of everyone's employees, who want to get back in the office, who while they're productive at home, it is driving them crazy. And they need to get back in. So there's a set of them. And then there'll be another set who will follow. And then there'll be a third set who are probably very reluctant for health, wellness, and safety reasons um, that they may not want to go in. But we're going to have to figure this out. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a challenge. That's, what we, that's how I'm thinking about our future. Profit is going to come by thinking revenue. Mm -hmm. And then by being as innovative as you can be and realizing that your crystal ball is... Sorry. 
That would be my son's uh, FaceTime, which uh, as we all know, <laughs> he's uh, on my account, so I love when I get that. Um, look, I think we 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 all got to get accept the fact that in most years we have a pretty good idea what the year is going to look like. In this year, we'll be lucky basically to have a sense of what two months look uh, two months ahead look like. And so, what you have to be is as agile, nimble, and as innovative as you can be as an organization, as a company. And all your employees need to be prepared for one thing and one thing that's going to be clear. And that is change, constant change. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready to accept that, you're not willing to adapt to the marketplace, I think you're going to have trouble basically delivering the results that your shareholders are going to expect from you um, and that you're, you'll need to deliver in order to sustain yourself as a company. But if you're willing to really embrace change and be willing to adapt and recognize that you don't have control over this situation, but you can make good choices as you get more new data, I think you can succeed that way. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, you know, everything's uncertain these days. So let's talk about, I mean, you've talked a lot about this already, but, um, you know, looking forward, uh, it sounds like you're really supporting your, your employees well right now. You know, looking forward into, uh, you know, if this continues into the third and fourth quarter, what are some new ideas that you have for supporting your employees if this uh, continues and they have to stay home? Um, into the third and fourth quarter. So as I said, we've got uh, we've got a number of wellness programs. Um, we'll expand those out. We'll probably add more components to that. And I'm very happy with the company who's we're working with. Um, and uh, you know, I think be beyond that, I think again, it, it's what I said before. Supporting them means open and honest communication, whatever that is, the good and the bad. The longer that we're in these times, and you know, I don't expect what well, we we're in a recession. Let's be honest. If we're not a depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't expect things to change significantly, but our ability to succeed is going to depend upon all of our employees, as I said before, rowing in the same direction and working together. And we support them best by being honest about where we stand, how, whatever that honesty may be. If that means that we're going to have to all take a pay cut in order to make sure that we can maintain everyone on the staff, that's what it will be. If it's going to mean layoffs, it's going to be layoffs. I found, um, you know, what the CEO of Uber did, you know, somewhat inspirational on a certain level, you know, and I found his team inspirational as well, which was, you know, he had to make a, a tough choice about whether or not to lay off his employees. He made that choice and delivered it to management. And the management team impressed me by saying, hey, we'd rather take a pay cut, you know, than let, lay off some of our engineers. And his answer back to them, which was not popular, was to say, no, we're going to lay people off because of the health of our company and the long term health of our company, this is the right thing to do. And while it can be difficult to make that type of choice in supporting your employees, you have to make the best choice for not just the short term, but also for the long term of the company. Otherwise, you get into bad cycles um, that don't end. Right, right. It's a challenge to figure out what, how to make decisions, especially when there's so much unknown that, that's going forward. Right. And that each company is dealing with that differently. So, right. So we've talked a lot about this already. Um, you have a wellness program for your employees. It sounds like you've done a great job with that. I, you know, a lot of the B2B meat executives are, are struggling with how to do a wellness program for their employees. Um, you've done a lot of different things for that. What advice would you give? I mean, your it sounds like your company, it, you know, it's obviously wellness is a, you know, success is a relative term, but you're, you know, from the B2B mean executives I talk to, uh, you're doing better than most. So what advice would you give to other B2B mean executives who are in industries that are really struggling, like travel and uh, hospitality, um, who are, you know, cutting costs and laying people off because they don't have a choice, you know, with the, you know, income not coming in since their industry is hit so hard. Do you have some advice for them on how they could create a wellness program for their employees? I think a, a couple of thoughts. Number one, I think, um, in thinking about the wellness of their employees, I think many of them have been very responsible uh, companies and CEOs um, in how they've handled these tough times and trying to be very uh, thoughtful uh, with regards to furloughs, with regards to ensuring that their employees can continue to have access to health care um, and insurance. Um, I think the, the work that people are doing when they haven't had to make the hard choices is really, really smart out there. And I commend uh, my colleagues in the marketplace. Uh, you know, with your current employees that are, that are still working for you, check in with them. Um, you know, the, the challenge right now isn't just about 
being scared about what comes next. It's mm -hmm. also about the workload itself and the change in pace. So I think a lot of us assumed, and I've worked from home before. So, you know, for me, it wasn't a surprise, but a lot of people think working from home is like, it's great. It's so much easier. It's less work. It's actually more work. Mm -hmm. You start your morning off um, even earlier and you end it even later. And you need to have distinct time to define between what are the work hours, what are my personal hours. And that's a part of the wellness program that we try to do is make sure people understand that and, and feel comfortable with that. We try to explain to people, you do need to take time off. You know, again, most people aren't right, right now. If you think about it, how many of your employees are actually taking vacation days right now? Not many. <laughs> Only not too many. <laughs> There's not really, no, it's no place to go, right? So why am I going to waste the vacation day? Waste the vacation day. But a vacation day is not wasted, right? And we've been, we've been clear also with our employees about sick days and the like to take the mental health days when they need it. To be thoughtful, we're not going to dock someone for taking a sick for taking more sick days. If they need it, tell us. Let's communicate and let's have a conversation. We work with each one of you. If you've got employees or parents who unfortunately, you know, have gotten ill and are struggling, you know, make sure that they feel fully supported. That's what we're doing. We're telling mm -hmm. them go get on the flight if you need to get on the flight. Don't stay here. I've had that conversation a few times. Get on the flight and go see your parents. That's more important than anything you can do for me. You're not going to remember this project or whatever it may be. You're going to remember not being there when you, when, when you wanted to be there. And I don't want to be the cause of that. I'd rather you be happy. Now, not, ever, not all of them are taking my advice in the sense that I'm trying to push them out because we can be stronger. Again, as a team, we work together to figure that out. And then, as I said, you know, outsource. Outsource the, the, some of the wellness program. You're not an expert on it. We found a great company with the health enhancement company to get the job done. But figure out whoever works for you who can bring in a program just to make sure that you're giving some opportunity. Not everyone's going to take advantage of it. We didn't expect everyone to. But the few that do, it's giving them some time for real mindfulness and being being healthier in what is going to be, you know, continue months ahead of challenges. Right, right. That's good advice. And again, I'd encourage the uh, attendees to post your questions in chat and we can answer those for you. So it sounds like you've talked a lot about how to help the mental health of your employees by, you know, encouraging them to take off, you know, to take time off if they need to, um, you know, to go see their family members. Um, so again, uh, you know, a lot of the, the B2B media executive community and the companies out there have not really been able to uh, you know implement the programs that you have so what advice would you give other b2b media uh, companies as far as how they can help the mental health of their employees so another thing that we did early on and i'll, I'll be honest to say we haven't done it recently but it's time for me to do it again is we put a survey out and i wasn't sure people would fill it out it's a very simple survey basically to our employees saying how are you doing rate rate your mental health if you're concerned if you're not concerned, you should be concerned. If you're concerned, you certainly should be doing this and sending it out. It's a really simple, the, the, the fact was the results that we got back were a lot more positive than I had thought. I was much more concerned than, than where I think most people felt. But I, as I said, even for me, I need to do it again and I'm gonna get off this phone call and tell my team, let's get another one out there and just check in. I think probably you should do this monthly. Just check in and figure out where are they at because if they are slipping and deteriorating their mental health, you want to be ahead of that because their health is your is the health of your company. Right, right. Yeah, that's really important. I think surveys are a really good idea because then, you know, the you know the people tell you what what they need and then you can implement, uh, you know, what their suggestions are. A lot of times, the best suggestions come from uh, from employees, sure. and I, I know I've seen management be able to really implement the the suggestions that the employees have. And and that's true, Kathy. Like the Slack channel has given us a bunch of ideas and things that we've implemented off the Slack channel. Um, I'm just trying to remember, call one off the top of my head, but you know, we've had a number of people write to me and say, "Hey, will you consider this?" And I'm like, "Absolutely, we'll do that." Um, right. And again, mm -hmm. they feel heard and they feel rewarded. Um, you know, I think look, the challenge is going to be we're not done with this. We're going to be in this for a little while, uh, for for a while longer. Um, what we want to do is basically help our employees to make sure that they're not burning out, I think is, a, is the hardest thing. And whether you've laid people off or not, as I said before, the workload is more now. Um, and how do you help them basically succeed through this is a question of understanding who has the need, right? Um, because not all of them are gonna raise their hand. What you wanna try to do is figure out, do everything anonymously, 
Um, and then if you're seeing a problem, again, I work a lot with my head of HR. We talk about this a lot to figure out what we can do. On the happy hours, I'm there trying to have drinks and trying to you know, keep it, keep the camaraderie going. Um, but as I said, there's nothing's going to replace our mental health than, you know, more so than getting back in the office. So I'm looking forward to that. Right. We're all looking forward to that. So yeah, the mental health of your employees is critical because, um, you know, the workload is heavier now and people are, you know, are more stressed and, you know, but mental health is, is extremely critical. So it sounds like you're doing a great job with the, with your employees on, on that subject. So Let's talk about um, how you've helped your employees who are afraid of layoffs and furloughs. You know, in the news every day, we hear about B2B media companies who are furloughing their uh, their people or laying their people off. Um, I'm sure that all of <laughs> all employees are afraid of the layoffs and furloughs. And um, so we want to talk about how you've been transparent and um, helped your your employees to uh, to not be afraid of um, layoffs and furloughs. I think the the biggest again it's honesty and being and being clear about where we are today and where we could be right um, and you know to, I've been clear that you know where we are today um, we're healthy um, we've gotten the support that we needed and we're in good shape where we could be is in a different situation if we're not able to continue to grow and continue to to maintain our success while that can be scary to hear the real that's a reality right and and you know not giving your employees reality is going to just create rumors anyway. It's better to tell them the reality and say, here's how you help. Here's what you need to do because you can help. And the way that you help, as I said before, is all of us working together. All of us finding solutions that are going to drive opportunity and revenue. And that's really been the, the success that we've had where, you know, good ideas. So, you know, for instance, um, uh, our, our head of creative is taking on the task of basically driving subscriptions from an editorial perspective. How can the editorial team help to drive more subscriptions? How can they be involved in the process? And where he's come at it from is a little different than where I would have. And he came up with some great ideas that I was like, you're right, that's something that we should be considering and thinking about more so than where I started from. And so that innovation and giving the power of the employees to have some say, regardless of their role, and where we're going to go, I think it's, it's you know that's empowering at the end of the day. Give them the power to help decide their own fate. It can't be fate complete that no matter what they do, layoffs or furlough is going to happen. They have to have hope. Hope has been the operative word that I've been using since the beginning of this crisis. And I've talked to my own editorial team about this, which is as much as bad news sells and as much as bad news creates more page views, we as a media company and all media companies have a responsibility to also give hope to our communities and give mm -hmm. hope to the world. And so we've written stories about what comes next. We've looked at China and done deeper dives. And we're looking for the good stories to tell about what's coming out of this because that level of happiness is part of your mental health and it's also helped people to understand that there is opportunity. Right, right. Everybody needs hope these days. It's, uh pretty challenging time for for other people so so that's great i mean uh, we really appreciate what you've uh, talked about jeff i mean so many people in our industry are really struggling and it's you know it's a challenging time for everyone and so you know being able to you know give hope to the people who are um you know struggling and you know being able to Help the people with, you know, the salespeople and all your employees with some of the stresses and the difficult times that, that they're going through. Um, you know, I think you've done a really good job of being able to help some of your people uh, to reduce the stress. And it sounds like, you know, you've done a great job of helping them to increase revenue, even in these difficult times. Um, do you have some some last uh, words of advice for uh, the B2B made executives? We're almost out of time. Um, sure. You know, if you have, you know, last minute advice, that'd be great. I think I think it's uh, I appreciate all your praise, Kathy, uh, but it's not me. It's my team. Right. And that's the, mm -hmm. that's the one thing I will say to my, my fellow media executives and CEOs and executive teams. It's all about your team. None of us succeed on, as an individual. They're the ones who basically help us get there. Empower them, good or bad times, help them to understand what the challenges are and help build an, the solutions that you need. And that's what's going to get us through this. There is hope. 
We all know this. We've all been through recessions before. And while we haven't, most of us, very few of us probably have lived through a depression, there was always a next. Mm -hmm. And what we can do is inspire the world, I think. And that's, I think I would tell all my media executives, help build those stories of hope because it's about how we perceive the world that drives us into a deeper recession or out of it into a growth phase again. And media's job, and media is not job, but part of what media can influence is how the world sees itself. And it can be very self-fulfilling. Let's provide more hope. Let's provide more opportunities. And if we do that, all of our businesses are going to be stronger and, and America will be stronger as well. Thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think hope is really what we as B2B media companies need to uh, need to, you know, give the world and certainly uh, hope is really critical and, you know, in, especially in these difficult times. And you're right, Jeff, uh, employees are the are the um, lifeblood of every B2B media companies. You know, we always say that our greatest assets are our employees. And um, so, you know, we really appreciate your time, Jeff. And um You've given a lot of great insights to uh, the B2B media community. We have recorded this and we will send the recording out to everyone. And again, thanks to Jeff um, with your insights and to your employees who are doing such a great job uh, to make you successful. Thanks again to MagHub and Fry Communications for, um, for sponsoring this. And we really believe that this is something, you know, some of these insights are what's going to be able to, you know, keep BDB media uh, executives and employees uh, successful in these great times. So thanks for joining us and have a good day and, um, you know, stay safe and well in these challenging times. Thank you, Kathy. Stay safe as well. And thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Take care. Thank you for your time. Thank you.